lot of people have felt that the distinguishing thing about science that uh, makes it so special and cuts it off from other ways of examining the world is the method that science uses, some characteristic, rigorous method that ensures the uh, accuracy of its conclusions better, at least, uh, than do the methods in, in other areas of inquiry. One very influential way of characterizing scientific method is in terms of its use of observation, especially experimental test. Now, while experiments are easier in some uh, sciences than in others, uh, nonetheless, the whole idea that theories should be testable, that theories should be observable, uh, that has been extraordinarily influential in the history of science. Today, we're going to look at one popular and uh, historically influential view about uh, science's method called verificationism. The man who invented the name positivism in, middle, in the middle of the 19th century was August Comte. It's spelled like August, except it's got an E on the end. Um, it's sort of like, just like the month. Um, and his uh, interest was to banish metaphysics. He thought that metaphysics had been the, uh, the bane of all intellectual work uh, that had gone before the 19th century, and that the developments of science in the 17th century and in the 18th century, and then also through the first part of the 19th century, had shown that the proper way to, uh, to undertake an understanding of the world is science. And I guess he meant by that something like uh, uh, rigor. Now, he presumably had some sort of notion about uh, what scientific method was, since he meant to banish all other methods, calling them all metaphysical. But in particular, he thought that all theological modes of reasoning ought to be kicked out. That these were misleading, uh, led only to false conclusions, and, uh, and, uh, and hurt people. So what he hoped for was, uh, was a, a new dedication of society to science, he believed on what we might now call sociological grounds that societies needed to have things like religions. And so uh, what he wanted to do was to replace all the organized and standard religions with the worship, if, uh, if you like, of science. Now that's uh, sort of an interesting concept, I suppose. He also felt that, uh, that uh, all areas of inquiry should be radically reformed to reflect this, uh, this uh, the scientific bias, or the scientific inclination, let's say. He wouldn't have said bias, I think. But uh, that was his view, and uh, positivism uh, went, uh, was, uh, was widely regarded. Just because science had been so successful, uh, it was almost a, a cult among intellectuals for a while, the whole notion of, uh, of positivism. Again, meaning at that time, kicking out metaphysics, which was thought to be speculative and uh, and, uh, and old, as a matter of fact, you get analysis, analyses from people. They talk about the religious mode of reasoning as being antiquated and sort of located in tribes and maybe in the dim and dark history of, the, of, the Western, of Western civilization. Uh, and then there's the, the metaphysical modes of reasoning, which uh, are sort of philosophical. They're kind of superior to theological modes of reasoning, religious modes of reasoning. But, uh, but uh, these, these uh, metaphysical modes of reasoning ought to be surpassed themselves by scientific modes of reasoning. So the new future of society was going to be scientific, as far as Comte and his followers were concerned. Now, his followers were not some small uh, cult. Does the name Ernst Mach ring a bell? Uh, you nod yes. Who is he? It just rings a bell. Uh, does anybody know who Ernst Mach is? He is a German scientist. Does anyone know in what field? Pardon? Um, physics generally, mechanics. He wrote a book called the uh, Die Mechanique. Why does the name Mach ring a bell? I'm sure that a lot of you don't know anything about the history of science. Yeah, Mach one, Mach two, Mach three. That's the speed of sound. Uh, Mach one is the speed of sound, and uh, and it's now the his name is now attached to the measure for the uh, for the speed of sound. And when an airplane travels twice or three times the speed of sound, it's said to travel at Mach two or Mach three, uh, and and that. Uh, label owes its name to Ernst Mach. So he's a very influential German physicist, but he was a positivist. Uh, he thought that metaphysics should be banned. And what that meant to him, for example, in the 19th century, along with lots of other scientists who were right at the cutting edge of chemistry and physics, and who were building what we now call the atomic theory of matter, 
What that meant to them, to the positivists in that crowd, was that the atomic theory of matter should not be taken seriously as a characterization of reality. What they said about it, Ernst Mach in particular, and other positivists among the physicists, was these are all clever uh, calculation devices, if you like. These theories offer us a means. We're going to return to this later when we talk about instrumentalism in science. I just want to note this right here. He said we should uh, not take seriously the idea that there really are atoms out there uh, that make up molecules. These things are unobservable. You can't see them. Nonetheless, that doesn't mean we have to kick out the theory. The theory is a nice device for, for organizing data, if you like. It's a nice device for organizing data. It's sort of like a filing system. A theory allows us to assign uh, certain variables to talk about. It's a language. It allows us to talk about phenomena in a certain way. But we shouldn't get metaphysical about it. Uh, we shouldn't think that. Uh, uh, just because the theory is useful in some way that uh, there really are these things called atoms. I mean, that would be ludicrous. And so that's the kind of attitude that I hope to characterize here is, uh, you know, I want you to understand as being sort of 19th century positivism. Hoping for not, spe and positive, uh, is, it's a sort of an unusual usage of the term, but what they meant by, the reason they were talking about positivism is because they were tired of what they took to be speculative, uh, attempts to explain nature. What they wanted was down to earth, verifiable, and that's the first time you're going to hear that word, verifiable statements about the physical world. And when you start talking about things that are not observable, then you're talking about things that are not verifiable. You're starting to start getting spooky here, you're getting philosophical, metaphysical, and this is to be resisted. In the middle of the 19th century, it still probably seemed that they had uh, only very recently managed to free, to, to liberate science from s the speculative uh, uh, character that it had had before the, s uh, the 17th century, say. And, uh, and I think that uh, a lot of them, when they started looking at theories like the, atom, uh, at, uh, the atomic theory, which began postulating things that you couldn't see, you couldn't taste, you couldn't feel, uh, it sure did look like that old metaphysical stuff coming back in. It looked like impetus. It looked like uh, natural places, that er the kinds of things that I mentioned Aristotle used to talk about. It really didn't look scientific to them. And so movement sprang up to sort of banish these sorts of things. That was 19th century positivism. So positivism is to be equated with um, testability. If you, and, and what? different positivists said testability was the criterion of, that's going to vary from theorist to theorist, but what we're going to start off with is a hardcore version. Uh, we're then going to go to a softer core version of positivism. Uh, actually, we're going to, this is going to all going to be part of something I'm going to call verificationism because there's another branch of positivism that, that we'll talk about next time. We'll talk about these today. Next time, we'll talk about falsificationism, which also uh, stresses uh, the importance of tests, but uh, in a different sort of way. Now, um, so positivism generally, all these theories we're going to discuss this time and next time is marked by, the, uh, uh, by its, its emphasis on tests, on observability, at least observability in principle. And uh, it's also uh, positivism always emphasized the, the deployment of tests uh, in, as experimental tests of theory and tried to talk about the logic of the relationship between theory and tests. Now. Um, what, goes, what I'm calling the hardcore, hardcore verificationism is associated with, uh, what, with the verifiability criterion of meaning. And the verifiability criterion of meaning says quite plainly and simply, if something, you, you choose what, if proposition, sentence, theory, whatever, belief, if it's to have any meaning at all, it must be verifiable. Right? Now, this is a very strong criterion. That's why I call it 
hardcore. This is a criterion of meaningfulness. In other words, what they're saying is anything that's not verifiable, and they've got metaphysics in the back of their mind, they've got any theory like the atomic theory that, you know, with they, as far as you can tell, isn't verifiable. Now, it's open to question whether it is or it isn't, but uh, Mach didn't think it was. Uh, it's certainly true, they're, they're talking about all religious theories that talk about gods that can't be seen, heard, felt, tasted, or whatever. Uh, these are not just false. I mean, they're not false. They're not even good enough to be false or true. They're meaningless. I mean, if you say, are there gods or not, what the, what the hardcore verificationist is going to say is that question isn't even good enough to be true or false. I mean, I can't even tell you it's false. It's just a meaningless question. It's gibberish. It's garbage. It's not that you have to have verified it in fact. Um, there are things that are going on uh, outside the solar system or even on the dark side of the moon that you know, can make meaning, perfectly meaningful propositions about, according to the, to the, to the, to the uh, hardcore verificationists. You can make perfectly uh, reasonable propositions about these things that are perfectly meaningful provided that you have at least some idea of how one might verify it. Not that you, it doesn't even have to be technologically possible, but if you can say, well, all right, what I mean by saying that there are things going on on the dark side of the moon is that if someone were there or if some mechanism were there that could make suitable recordings, it would record suitable things. You know, like it might take pictures or it might make sounds or it might record, if you're saying there's earthquakes on the dark side of the moon, even though there are no uh, seismographs up there, what, all you have to do is to be able to specify what sort of thing in principle would count as the kind of observation that would distinguish between the truth and falsity of that. All you have to do is be able to say, well, if we did have a seismograph up there, then what my sentence comes down to is that it would be registering something other than the norm. So all I mean is that you should, if, in order for the sentence to be meaningful, you should be able to specify what sort of thing would count as a verification of it. And, you're, and what you assert when you assert the thing is, uh, is that you would observe X if you had the suitable equipment. What this is just supposed to do is show that, uh, that they're not being totally unreasonable when they try and banish metaphysics. They just want to banish things that don't make any difference. So that, for example, if I were to tell you that back there in that corner, everyone look please, Back there in that corner, just below the clock, is a six-foot-tall, undetectable bunny. And I say it's undetectable. I mean it is absolutely undetectable. There's no way at all to detect that. There's no way to determine whether that's true or false. Whether, you know, there's no way to verify it. Well, the positivists would say, well, it's all very nice. <laughs> But, you know, if it's in principle unverifiable, it's meaningless. You've made no proposition whatsoever. Now, if I said you can't see it, but indeed here are some things, tests you could perform. I mean, you could put a carrot over here and it would be gone after 20 minutes. Verification say, ah, oh, well, maybe that's not so meaningless after all. At least you've offered us some potential observation that could be made that would tend to verify your assertion. But now, if we've got two propositions, two different propositions that uh, would equally well explain the missing carrot, one of them, uh, you know, the, the big six-foot-tall, otherwise undetectable rabbit, uh, two, uh, maybe there's a, you know, somebody that likes carrots and they're sitting over there nibbling in the back, in the, in the back of the room, well, the positivist has some definite thoughts about which one we should pre prefer. It's the one that uh, requires uh, less of a, an extension of our normal test, testing procedures and, and requires less imagination and speculation. Uh, gods, I think uh, the verificationists, or the hardcore verificationists, probably thought they'd banish mo uh, most or all gods uh, altogether by this criterion. But I suppose if there are some, you know, some people would claim that, no, I mean, you know, God is not somebody who, or something that is undetectable. I mean, you can see God's, uh, you see evidence of God in all sorts of things. Uh, the verificationists wouldn't say that that's meaningless, but uh, would point out that there are other ways of explaining, the you know, would say that there are other ways of explaining 
the same things that God supposedly explains that, that do not require this extra hypothesis so that the, the, the hypotheses of physics, for example, and the uh, physics plus bi uh, evolutionary biology say, and the hypothesis of God are empirically equivalent if they explain the same data. And what we should do is to prefer the more parsimonious one. This is called Occam's razor. We should prefer the one that requires us to, to postulate uh, fewer uh, unusual or in this case, supernatural sorts of things. Now, uh, what it does banish is any divinity that is absolutely 100% unverifiable, undetectable, unobservable. And what the verificationist wanted to say is not just, well, let's focus our attention here on uh, a class of statements that are ex ex uh, exceptionally interesting from the point of view of science, namely the ones that are observable or have observable consequences. They wanted to say no proposition that is unverifiable is even meaningful. That was a very bold, it was, an was anti-metaphysics. They want to say metaphysics is meaningless because unverifiable. And in a way, they defined metaphysics as that which is unverifiable. Uh, Remember what Mach says about atoms. He says, look, I mean, well, it's, it, it, it might be a useful device for some purposes, but we shouldn't take seriously the idea that these things exist. And, and uh, B.F. Skinner would say, uh, this is uh, quite apart from uh, things that, uh, that uh, other things that Skinner might say, but he would say, there's nothing wrong with a mentalistic, uh, to say that I have a feeling or that I have a mind, if you're just kind of informally speaking, is that my mind uh, tells me this, or uh, I have a certain feeling. That's a perfectly de decent uh, uh, expression, according to Skinner, but we don't have things called feelings that are somehow stored in there. No, we feel. It's an activity. It's a process. It's not a thing we have, and we've got to be careful about the implications of these modes of speaking. Well, this is precisely what the positivists want to say. These modes of speaking might be very, very useful for certain purposes, but be, beware if you suddenly become committed to little things called atoms or electrons or quarks. I mean, you can't see these things. You can't even in principle see these things. The, the, ar the argument about whether uh, uh, atoms even had structure uh, is you know centuries old, and the argument about whether electricity is to be understood as a particle-like or wave-like phenomenon is still kind of weird to this day. Uh, so whether these little things called particles, the electron is supposed to be the particle that the bears the negative electric charge, um, they're still it's still kind of dubious how you how you're supposed to talk about those things. There's a nice mathematical language, but what English words to use to describe these phenomena is not at all clear. And what the, the positivists the, uh, in any era would say is these mathematical languages do not abandon them, but remember, they're just notation devices. They're calculation devices. They help us get from data to data. Uh, they, we got some input data. We plug them into our equations, and these equations allow us to make accurate pr predictions about what observables. And that's all that counts is that we're able to make accurate predictions about what will happen in an experimental setting. So you might want to say, we observe an electron. Doesn't matter. Forget about the electron. The electron is just a convenient device to predict that, under certain circumstances, we will hear a click on that Geiger counter, or that we will see a, a cloud trace in that Wilson cloud chamber, or that we will get a certain result on the oil drop experiment. That's what's really going on here, according to the positivists. Our theories are mere calculation devices. We shouldn't take them seriously as talking about things in the external world. And the criterion for meaningfulness is verifiability. If a sentence or proposition, whether scientific or not, if it's not verifiable, if there's no way of, you know, uh, that you can even say how we should go about demonstrating the proposition to be true, well then, it's not meaningful. Now I want to return to the remark made up there, and then we'll get into another brand of verificationism, the soft core, because it was the hardcore verificationists, to their credit, that one day opened up their eyes and say, said, whoop. <laughs> they said, uh-oh. And it involved the, the criterion of, of uh, I'm sorry, the, 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 the verificationist criterion of meaning itself. The verifiability criterion of meaning says what? 
It says, a proposition is meaningful only if it is verifiable, otherwise meaningless. Now, what kind of thing would it be to verify that? I mean, how would you demonstrate it to be true? It's not the sort of thing that you could demonstrate to be true. It's sort of like a, it's a suggested norm. It's saying we, what it says tacitly is, we should no longer take seriously things. It's a, it's a should statement, right? It says we should steer clear of metaphysics. We should not take seriously any metaphysical propositions. We should only attend to verifiable propositions. It's a norm. It's not verifiable. Well, <laughs> if not verifiable, then what <clears throat> on the verifiability criterion of meaning? Gibberish. <laughs> Meaningless gibberish. So they said, whoop, <laughs> and they fell back with a variety of different sorts of reactions. Fell back to the second, uh, the, to the soft core position, which involves not a verifiability uh, criterion of meaning, but instead the verifiability criterion of demarcation. Uh, those words we're going to have to talk about, and we will. Uh, but first, the one more question. Yes? So what if you had a theory that was not verifiable at the present time? If you mean uh, is not verifiable because we lack the technology, right. then that doesn't stand in the way of its being meaningful even on the hardcore theory, even on the verification, verifiability criterion of meaning. All that's required is that there be some way in principle, not in fact, that you could specify, like for example, having a seismograph on the dark side of the moon, something that you could explain what you meant, what you would expect to find out if you performed the relevant tests. Tell us what the relevant tests would be. Like you could say, I think there's a giant zebra behind Pluto that always stays back there and, and we can never see it. That can be as meaningful as you please. I mean, false in their view, but it, that's as meaningful as you please if what you mean is, well, if we had a spaceship and went around back there, there'd be this big giant zebra. I mean, if that's what you, that's fine. That makes it meaningful. The problem is when you say, I think there are some things that are just absolutely undetectable. And they'll say, well, think away, but what could you possibly be talking about? <laughs> what could you possibly mean in, say, I mean, uh, uh, in saying that there are things that uh, couldn't possibly be detected by sight, sound, any means, no, no machinery, no mechanism could possibly detect it? What could you possibly mean? I don't know if this, how close this is or not. Just in saying that, it struck me as bearing a resemblance to the, to the following thesis, which I think is, probably, is at least you know, plausible. And that's that there's nothing you could say that doesn't try to, uh, no, no description that you can offer that doesn't try to bring the thing described under known categories. Like if I try to describe something that's uh, strange or unusual, I will try and tell you what it's like. And what I'm doing there is trying to show you what sort of thing to expect, even though I'm telling you it's strange and unusual, it's different. It's kind of like this in that respect, it's kind of like that in the other respect. I think what the verificationists were grappling with was something like that idea, except they wanted to make it a little bit, they wanted to pin it down a little bit better than that. So what they said was, um, you, need to be, you need to specify just ex not just what kind of thing it is, but to specify which steps you'd have to take in order to uh, verify, you know, to, to test the thing, uh, what you just said. That will establish what it means. Now then, to perform the tests, we'll decide whether the sentence is true or false. Like, what the sentence, according to the verificationists, the, the hardcore ones, what the sentence about that zebra floating out there in space means has something to do with what sorts of things, you know, would happen if you were on a, in a ship out there, or sent an observing uh, probe out there. To, to specify you know, which readings you'll get, what images you'll get, what pictures you'll get, uh, that exhausts the meaning of the sentence. 
uh, you will see something with stripes rather than something without stripes. That's why we say it's a zebra. That's what it means to say it's a zebra. It will look sort of horse-like. Uh, that's what it means to, to uh, that's another part of saying it's a zebra rather than a skunk. And it will, it will be very, very large, much larger than the normal horse. That's what it means to say it's a giant, <laughs> right, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that, the way we flesh out, for the, for the hardcore verification, it's the way we flesh out the meaning of any sentence at all, it doesn't have to be scientific, is in terms of what, what would happen if we did that. That's operationalizing it. That shows you our, how you would perform, how would you investigate it, and what you would expect to get. Now, let's get in a ship and go out there on the other side of Pluto and look. Ha! No zebra. Now, sentence turns out to be false. But it can't even be false or true until you have a, until it, it, it is meaningful, unless it's meaningful. Again, the simple, I mean, simple, simple question was, uh, what about stuff we can't now verify, but we managed to verify it later? No problem. It's meaningful all the way through, as long as you could say what sort of things would have to be done to verify it, even though we can't. An example, a case in point, and this is the sort of thing that the verificationists, whether hardcore or softcore, love. Albert Einstein proposed the general theory of relativity in 1916. It's an extraordinarily abstract and difficult theory. And it was proposed not in order to explain any known anomalies or problems or any kinds of experiments that no one could explain. That wasn't the problem at all. Uh, the reason it was proposed is to offer a better organization or synthesis of physics. I'll try and explain that a little later. So right then in 1916, when it was proposed, there weren't any experiments that were especially well confirmed by that. And Einstein and others who were sort of interested in theory had to try and think of what kind of experiment could be performed that would verify the theory. And it wasn't real easy to do. Einstein himself thought up of at least one, and I don't know whether he thought up the other two, but for the longest time, right up into the 50s, I think, there were only about three known ways to verify the theory. And in 1916, in particular, um, the one way that seemed likely to be easiest to verify it couldn't be done for practical reasons. There was a war going on. So it wasn't until 1919 that the observation was performed. And when it was performed, it seemed to verify uh, the general theory of relativity. But in those intervening years, the theory wasn't meaningless, according to positivists. It's just that. Einstein had proposed how to test the theory, thereby establishing its meaningfulness. He said, if you, if you perform such and such an experiment, if my theory is right, you'll see this. If my theory is wrong, you should see that. And that's sufficient to establish its meaningfulness, even though the, 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 the tests had not yet been performed. But of course, we've got a problem. Let us uh, see what they did. I, I've suggested that what they've done is to uh, go from the ver hardcore verifiability or verificationism to soft core verificationism. And uh, in this, they adopt, rather than a criterion of meaning, a crit criterion of demarcation. Now, the whole idea of a criterion of demarcation was actually introduced, I mean, that expression, criterion of demarcation, was actually introduced later by Karl Popper, who we're going to talk about next time. Uh, but. Um, <coughs> the, uh, the general idea is this. What we want to know is what's the difference between science and non-science. What is the demarcation line? What, is, what divides science from pseudoscience? The way uh, Popper explained it, or I, actually I should be careful here. Uh, his student, Imre Lakatos, explained it this way. Uh, he was telling this story about Popper. Now I'm taking Lakatos to know what Pop, Popper went through. But the idea was this. Back in the teens, 1916, 17, 18, 19, 20, uh, when Popper was going to school in Vienna, Vienna was an extraordinarily booming place. I mean, everything was going on there. Uh, first of all, it, was, uh, it, it just left the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which was just in, on the verge of collapse because of World War II. But it had been collapsing for some time, probably for 15 years. The war. Is, will be the end of it. Uh, so in much the same way as the Soviet empire is collapsing right now, at that particular time, the Austro-Hungarian empire was collapsing. Now, what's interesting is that as the Austro-Hungarian empire collapsed, an empire which had preached the evils of socialism 
for all of its days since Karl Marx, Marx had written in the middle of the century, the fact that the powers were collapsing meant that everyone felt free to move into this previously forbidden area. Karl Marx's scientific socialism, his scientific approach to why it is that societies change. They change because of the changing material conditions of production. They change because in the end of economic forces that are out of the control of revolutionaries, out of the control of, of state leaders. They just are facts that leaders and uh, ideologues will just have to deal with. I mean, Marx was extraordinarily impatient with ideology and revolutionaries who would try to inflict ideology on history. History uh, guides itself by facts. And so this was scientific socialism. And this was just all the rage in Vienna. At the same time, uh, there was a new architecture that was springing up in Vienna, new art forms, uh, brand new sorts of music. Uh, Freud, Sigmund Freud was in Vienna. And physics was uh, in Vienna. I mean, the, some of the great discoveries were going on in Berlin, but it was in Central Europe, in Germany, and in Austria, where some of the great work was being done in physics uh, in those years. Uh, and Popper was being educated at that time. And so Popper said um, to himself, uh, how is it that I am not as impressed with such uh, supposedly scientific theories as Marx's, or Freud's for that matter, as I am with Einstein's. I mean, just to take an example. Here are several, I mean, what Freud was doing, for example, was offering what was billed at the time as the first scientific uh, theory, first scientific interpretation of human behavior, of human psychology. Um, and uh, so there were, you know, all the intellectuals were flocking. And again, there's this influence of positivism that says everything scientific is good. And so what Popper says is, well, I do like science, but how, what, what is it that makes me suspicious about these things like Marxism and its claim to be scientific, or Freudianism and its claim to be scientific? And while at the same time I seem to, I seem to find that I'm, I'm, I'm a believer in the scientific character, anyway, of the general theory of relativity. Even though it hasn't been tested yet, it's plainly a scientific theory. And even though it may be wrong, it's clearly a scientific theory. So I mean, he's not talking about what's right and what's wrong. He even said you know, he was kind of sympathetic to Marxism. He was sympathetic to Freudianism. But he did not think of them as scientific theories. What's the difference? How come Dar Darwinian or Mendelian genetics and Darwinian evolutionary theory, how come they seemed scientific, he wanted to know. But these other things don't. What is the criterion I'm using? There's some, some criterion I'm using to distinguish science from pseudoscience, to put it baldly. Now, Popper's the one that, now that was when he was in school, and later in the 30s he offered an alternative to the verifiability criterion of demarcation that we're going to discuss now. But the verifiability criterion of demarcation goes like this. It says, verifiability is not the necessary condition of meaningfulness. Things can be meaningful even though they're not verifiable. Like, for example, this sentence, <laughs> that very sentence. Um, things can be meaningful even though they're not verifiable. However, in order to be scientific, a sentence must be verifiable. Scientists, said the soft core verificationists, scientists are concerned only with propositions, sentences, beliefs, assertions that are in principle verifiable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a softening of the position. It's no longer a criterion of meaningfulness. It's a criterion of demarcation. And it's here that they would point to uh, to theories that are extraordinarily abstract, like Einstein's, and explain what the difference is between Einstein's theory of ge uh, general relativity, for example, and some other theory like, uh, well, any arbitrary philosophical theory, Plato's theory of forms, say, which you may or may not know about, or, or uh, Descartes' theory about uh, mind and matter, the bifurcation of, uh, of the human being into a material and a mental realm. Uh, the, 
Softcore verification has said the problem with those theories is not that they're meaningless. It's uh, they're, the fact that they're not verifiable, that there's nothing you could do to verify one of those theories, uh, just shows that it's not scientific. And so if, you're, you know, if you want to do metaphysics, that's fine. It wasn't for the hardcore verification. It's the softcore verification. Well, you know, if you want to, do the, you want to do metaphysics, that's OK. It might even be useful, helpful, illuminating in some way, but it's not science. If you want to get down to science, then that's when we'd better, that's when we should stick to these uh, verifiable propositions. Take, for example, Einstein's general theory of relativity. Now the point, the reason that Einstein was moved to seek and to try to work out the general theory of relativity was because of a fact about the special theory of relativity. It was incomplete. I mean, he knew it was incomplete at the time. What he was trying to do was to formulate the laws of physics. This is what he was trying to do in the special theory of relativity uh, so that uh, they would remain the same. You would get the same formulation of the laws of physics whether you were on an object that was uh, uh, stationary or whether it was in motion with respect to some arbitrary reference frame. He would wanted to sort of simplify the laws of physics so they would co come out the same from any so-called inertial frame of reference. That is, uh, frames of reference that were either at rest with respect to one another or in uniform motion, uniformly uh, you know, uh, it just, uh, motion with respect to one another. Uh, not in particular, he w the special theory of rel relativity did not uh, formulate the laws of physics in such a way so that they would come out the same on an object that was accelerating with respect to another frame of reference. So that, for example, the laws of physics would have to be formulated differently on an object that was rotating another object, like the Earth around the sun, than it would from the point of view of the sun. Now, this was a, an embarrassment. I mean, not an embarrassment, but this was an incompleteness in the special theory of relativity that needed correcting. And so what Einstein spent time doing is trying to figure out just how to reformulate the laws of physics so that they were completely general, so that they would appear to be the same no matter whether you were on a, uh, you know, just take an arbitrary frame of reference like the center of the sun, uh, they would be completely the same whether you were at the center of, uh, of the sun, or of course you'd be pretty warm there, uh, or whether you were uh, at rest with respect to the center of the sun, or whether you were moving in uniform uh, linear velocity with respect to the sun, or whether you were accelerating toward the sun, or accelerating away from the sun, or orbiting the sun. He wanted perfectly general laws of physics, uh, laws of motion especially, that could be, uh, could be formulated so that they would come out the same for all those perspectives. Now that was his reason. It was a systematic reason. That was his main reason for trying to figure out the, the, the general theory of relativity. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so, so his reasons didn't have anything to do with trying to explain the perihelion of Mercury, nor were there any other phenomena that he was trying to accommodate in going from the special theory to the general theory. Indeed, he was always a, mostly a systematic thinker and a generalist, very abstract. Okay, so anyway, he formulates the theory. Uh, it, it's all abstract work, all looks philosophical. I mean, this is why it's a neat test case, because his reasons were abstract, didn't have anything to do with experiments or observables. His, uh, the theory that came out was extraordinarily ex abstract and looked really strange. Really, really strange. Let me give you an example of its strangeness. Uh, in the normal course of things, we're taught Euclidean geometry. And uh, among the axioms of Euclidean geometry is this one. Uh, here is a, let's say the, the, the surface I'm drawing on is a Euclidean plane. And the axiom goes like this. If you've got a line in that plane and then there's a point off that line, but still on the plane, then there is one and only one line <laughs> that you can draw through that point parallel to that line in that plane. Now, that's a lot of words, right? Uh, it's, a, it's, a com it's a complex uh, axiom to state. But if I stated it well enough, it should be obvious to you. Does it seem obvious that, of course, that's true? That there's one and only one line parallel to that line through that point? Not for Carl. OK. But in any case, uh, that is the fifth Euclidean axiom. Now, it is so clumsy to say that for centuries, you know, because Euclid, Euclid was a student of Plato's, or I'm sorry, uh, Aristotle was a student of Plato's and Euclid was a student of Aristotle. So this is an old system, Euclidean geometry. It's so clumsy that for centuries people were trying to figure out whether they could possibly derive this one from the other four, which were much more simple. And if they could just have a system of four axioms and not this clumsy one, uh, that would be so nice. 
Well, they never were able to do it, but part of that effort in the 19th century went this way. A lot of people like a man named Riemann, math mathematician named, uh, there's others. Riemann is, uh, is foremost among them. Lobachevsky comes later. He's another uh, geometer. But uh, just, just, to, just to see if they could uh, construct, could prove that this axiom, this fifth one, was deducible from the others, they said, let's go in the back door. Let's try an indirect proof. Euclid's fifth. Okay. Uh, let's try an indirect proof. Let's assume that it's wrong. <laughs> let's pretend we can have, let's just say we can't make sense of this. Let's say we can have two or three or four or even an infinite number of parallel lines through that point in that plane uh, to that line, etc. Let's just assume the contrary. Let's, see, let's start out with two. Now, we can't picture that, right? That doesn't make any sense to picture, but let's just say it. And let's see if we can derive a contradiction with the other four. Well, they worked and they worked and they worked, and not only did they not derive a contradiction, they proved that they couldn't derive a contradiction, and instead they produced a perfectly consistent non-Euclidean geometry that just had this new axiom placed in there instead of the old one. Okay? And in addition, they then went on to try some other theories, and they got other non-Euclidean geometries. Well, what general relativity theory says, now those were just sort of mathematicians' delights back then in the 19th century, but what general relativity theory says is our universe is not Euclidean. The physical theory that we believe now about the physical universe says it is not Euclidean. But it's not any one of these others either. What it is is something that varies, the very structure of geometry. The geometrical structure of space-time changes as you move from place to place in the universe as a function of the concentrations of mass. If you get real close to something with a lot of mass, like a star or a sun, the geometry of space changes. The whole picture, the geometry of space changes, and is very different there or near a black hole, which is even uh, worse if we're not, we haven't confirmed that definitely, but it certainly is, seems like a good theory and it works well with lots of other things. Near a black hole, the, 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 the geometry of space-time is even more perturbed, more disturbed, and the differences between those places, which are near concentrations of mass, and places that are relatively uh, in relatively free space, the differences in geometry are massive. <laughs> They're big, okay, big differences. Now, it's that fact that, that the th general theory of relativity pre predicts that the geometry of space, space-time actually, the geometry of space-time alters in the presence of massive objects. That's the key to Einstein's bright idea about how to test his theory. This is supposed to be a good illustration of the verifiability criterion de demarcation. This is supposed to show just the sort of thing that makes Einstein's speculative abstract endeavor a scientific one, as opposed to the abstra equally abstract, equally difficult uh, 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 intellectual endeavors conducted by the philosophers like Plato and, and, and the others. Einstein's is different and scientific because verifiable. And it's this key fact about the geometry of space-time, curiously enough, that turns out to be the, 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 the key to figuring out how to perform a verification, to figure out what kinds of steps would be taken to show that his theory is true. The verifiability criterion of demarcation, offered by what I've called the soft core verificationists, seemed to many to really capture the very special feature about science that made it so successful. But as we'll see, uh, even it came under rather heavy fire, and, and this for logical reasons. 